Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. A brief note to the listener. Due to technical difficulties that arose at this event, the quality of the recording was significantly diminished. This issue was resolved partway through the talk, so you will hear the quality restored as you progress through the lecture. We apologize for this inconvenience and trust that you will still benefit from the rich content of Dr. Howell's presentation. Thank you. Our speaker this evening is President and Director of Academic Research for the Eucharist Project, an international movement promoting knowledge and love of the Eucharist worldwide. Dr. Kenneth J. Howell taught in higher education for almost 30 years, most recently for over a decade as a professor of religion at the University of Illinois, where he taught classes on the history, theology, and philosophy of Catholicism. At the same time, he served as the director of the Institute of Catholic Thought of the St. John's Catholic Newman Center at the same university. He was a Presbyterian minister for 18 years. During his ministry and teaching, Dr. Howell's own reading on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist started him on a six-year journey that eventually led him to Catholicism. On June 1, 1996, Dr. Howell was confirmed and received into the Catholic Church at St. Charles Borromeo Parish in Bloomington, Indiana. In 2000, he received the Pro Ecclesia et Pontifice Award, the lay equivalent of the title Monsignor, from Pope St. John Paul II in recognition of his service to the church. Dr. Howell has been married to Sharon Canfield for 43 years, and they have three children, and we had to update this, nine grandchildren. Just last year, it was six. <laughs> so they're beating my parents. All right, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Howell. Good evening. Thank you, Andrew Hickman, for that very fine introduction. Um, I know people say this a lot, but I am delighted to be here this evening. I have great thanks in my heart for, to God for the opportunity to be with you. Um, I have been in contact with and even worked with the Institute of Catholic Culture for a little bit over a year, and when they asked me to come to give this presentation this evening, I was delighted to be able to come this way and to do that. I also want to thank Father Hezekiah Karnatso. Uh, it was through a mutual friend of ours that I initially learned about the Institute and am delighted at the work that it's doing. I pray every day that God will prosper the work of the Institute because education is deep in my heart and they're doing such a great work in educating people in the faith. Particularly for, to Andy, Andrew Hickman, I'd like to thank for his professionalism in making this all possible in the communications that we've had and arranging this. I'd be remiss if I didn't especially mention Eric and Monica Ortiz because Eric and Monica have been my hosts and my uh, chaperone and so forth. So thank you so much for all that you've done and are doing for the church. But lastly, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming here this evening because you've taken a night out and a cold one at that uh, to enjoy together growing in our Catholic faith. When I think about the Catholic faith, as I was telling Andrew a few moments ago, it's been 20 years now since I was received into the Catholic Church. When I went to teach in the Presbyterian Seminary, after finishing my PhD at Indiana University, I never dreamed of being a Catholic. And yet, God has surprises for us. Has he had some for you? 
And the surprise that God had for me was when I started to teach a class on the Eucharist. And I began investigating anew the text of the New Testament, the history of doctrine with regard to that. And I discovered that what I had believed and been taught in seminary was not in fact the case. That my Calvinist faith was not the faith of the early church, but that the faith of the early church could truly be called a Catholic. Somewhere along in that process, I knew what I had to do. And that's why this lecture tonight means something to me. Because I didn't choose this topic. It was chosen for me by the Institute. But it just so happens that St. Justin Martyr's feast day in the current calendar is June the 1st. And that's the day I became a Catholic. But it was also my 44th birthday. And it was also the day my oldest daughter graduated from high school. So it was a, mul- a day of multiple blessings. St. Jo- Justin was one of my patron saints in that process. St. Justin Martyr. Who was he and why is he important? Well, in reviewing my previous learning and expanding it recently, I've come to realize that I have much more to say than I could possibly say in the time allotted tonight. But you have an outline in front of you that I prepared, which is really a truncated version of my notes. Unfortunately, as I was looking over the truncated version, I realized that some of the most important things that I think I'll say tonight are not in those on the other sheets. So if you'd like to take notes and at least listen carefully, um, I'd be very appreciative. St. Justin Martyr was born, we think, around 100 A.D. And he was born in Flavia Neapolis, which had been settled by the Romans. Flavia Neapolis was in Syria, and it was a Roman colony. And so he grew up probably as an educated young man, Greek being his native language, he grew up studying the great Greek classics. At least we can probably suppose that. But somewhere in his young adult life, he realized that he didn't know the truth. And so he began to search far and wide, studying all the philosophies of the ancient world. And eventually, he arrived at his penultimate stop in Platonism. And I'll explain later why Platonism was attractive to him. But then as he kept searching, there was something else gnawing the way of his heart, which said that Platonism is good, but it's not enough. Much like St. Augustine said the same thing in the 5th century. So we think around the year 130, Justin Martyr converted to Christ in the church. And as a philosopher, he made his way from Syria, then to Ephesus, and then eventually to Rome, where he was martyred for the faith during the reign of the emperor philosopher Marcus Aurelius. On your sheet you will see there tonight the titles of his three most famous works. We have some things that we think are ascribed to him, but are probably not his writings. But these we are certain are his writings. The first apology, which is his longest apology, apologia meaning defense of the faith. That's why the great thing by Plato is called the apology of Socrates. It's the defense of Socrates. So this is the defense of Christianity. The second apology, which seems to be a condensation of that, but which is still very much worth reading because you begin to get the main points in a very short order. Then you can go to the first one, and in fact, you probably should read them in that order. And then finally, the longest of his writings, the dialogue with Trifo the Jew, which really deals with the interaction of Judaism as it was in the second century with Christianity. And the argument there is a question of who are the true heirs of the ancient Israelite faith of the Old Testament? Is it present-day Judaism, as it was known then, or is it Christianity? It didn't take long after that for Christianity and Judaism to go very much in separate ways, not always with the best of feelings. St. Justin Martyr is important 
has been important throughout the history of the church, but it's even important today for many reasons. Tonight I've singled out three that I want to bring to your attention. First of all, he gives us a defense against unjust accusations leveled against Christians. Some of those accusations were atheism, but not in the modern sense. The Christians were atheists. They didn't believe in the Roman gods. Though they claimed that they believed in the supreme and only God, they didn't nevertheless endorse the religious diversity of the Roman Empire. They were accused of cannibalism because they spoke of eating the body and blood of Jesus Christ and the Romans, like the modern New York Times, (laughs) constantly misunderstands Christian language. And they took it too literally. And so they accused them of cannibalism. They were accused of immorality and particularly incest because they spoke of loving their brothers and their sisters. And again, the world misunderstanding their language accused them of immorality. And then they were also accused of socio-political disloyalty. And I'm going to come back to that point when I talk about persecution a little bit later this evening. Because I think you'll see in that that in fact we face exactly the same situation they faced in the second century. And that's what makes relevant the work and the life of St. Justin Martyr. The second point that is so important for us here tonight is to understand his doctrine of the logos. Now you know everybody is familiar with the term logos. It's the word, the Greek word that translates in John, the beginning, in the beginning was the... No, 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 no. In fact, I'm going to write the Pope and say you better retranslate the Bible here. Because as I will explain later, the word, word in English cannot begin to express what logos means in John or in Justin. And so I want to explain to you more what he meant by that. But one of the things he did mean was that all truth, all reason, and our ability to get to truth through reason is given to us by God and is therefore to be honored and supported and advanced. That laid the foundation for the intellectual culture of the medieval world, the universities, and now into today. Sadly, we don't really have universities anymore. And if you want to know more about that, I'll explain it to you. (laughs) The third point. In the first apology, he introduces what may appear to a modern person as being a strange topic to have a debate about. If you look among today people that write books about atheism or agnosticism or various philosophies, they don't usually bring up the liturgy of the church and the Eucharist. But he does. And the question I want to ask tonight is, why in this treatise addressed to pagan rulers would he bring up the question of the liturgy and the Eucharist? And I think by the end of this evening we'll see there was a very good reason. But the overriding question that I've listed there on your handout, the question we want to have everything revolve around tonight is this. What can Justin Martyr teach us about the search for true wisdom, true philosophy, and its fulfillment in Christ? Now, in order to do that, we have to understand, as best we can from 20 centuries removed, what was driving St. Justin. And after many years of teaching in the university, I discovered something that really astounded me. Because I must admit, when I was a young professor teaching, I was very naive. And I was naive when I thought that if you had a decent amount of intelligence and that if you had goodwill, you would be looking for truth. I'm sorry to have to inform you that many people in universities are not looking for truth. And the reason I say that is that I've come to realize that the search for truth is not so much about how much intellect you have as how much moral character you have. 
Are you searching for what is good, for what is true, for what is beautiful? St. Justin Martyr did. But what was he looking for? As I asked on the handout there, what kind of truth was he looking for? You see, in universities today, we have professors of this or that who know more and more about less and less. They're very much specialists. And to succeed in a university career, you have to do that. I've been through it, I know. But I'm not sure that's real education, to be honest with you. And I think that St. Justin Martyr was looking for a different kind of truth. He wasn't looking for particular truths. He was looking for a comprehensive truth. That's the first kind of truth. He was looking for something that put everything together, that gave us the ultimate cause of all particular truths. Secondly, he was looking for a truth to live by. He wasn't just looking for theory. He was looking for how to have a philosophy that would lead him to a better life. To live in, to teach him to live a more virtuous life. And thirdly, he was looking for a truth that would lead to his personal and all human fulfillment. Much like Aristotle spoke of in his, in his ethics books, he said that man's end is to find eudaimonia, which is traditionally translated happiness. But we could translate today human fulfillment. What is it that will fulfill a human being? It's so nice to look out tonight and to see some gentlemen that show my hair color. <laughs> Many of you men may be retired, you women, retired, or close to it. And you've been through careers. And the question I would like you to answer for yourself tonight is, was that career the purpose of your life? What is the fulfillment? Our young people are told often that they find the right job, they find the right career, something they love, they will be fulfilled. Well, I tell my students they should probably rethink that. Yes, careers are good, and one of them enjoyed mine, and I believe it's what God wanted me to do. But that's not the ultimate human fulfillment. St. Justin was looking for a truth that could lead him to fulfillment. So if you look on the outline, tonight the second point that I want us to look at is in order to understand the power of what St. Justin Martyr says in his writings, you first have to understand the context in which he was speaking. And there's two contexts to understand. One is the socio-political context, the other is the intellectual context. And I'll try to describe both of them for you as best I can. To give you the sense of the importance of context, let me give you an expression and ask you what it means. Suppose you hear someone yell out in the crowd, we have a touchdown. Where do you imagine yourself to be? In a football game, right? But if you are at, a, at an airport, and there's been trouble with the plane, and someone comes on the speaker and says, we have a touchdown. Then the meaning is quite different, right? So context is important for discerning what meaning is. And that, in fact, is how we discern meaning, is we figure out what the context is, and we do this in a flash of moment. Some people are faster at it than others. I'm kind of slow personally, but nevertheless, my wife is very fast at it. And she gets the context real quickly. We need context. So what was the context of St. Justin Martyrs? What was the socio-political context in which he lived? This could be illustrated from a number of places, but tonight I'd like to direct your attention to an exchange of letters between Pliny the Younger and the Emperor Trajan. Trajan was the Emperor of Rome between 98 AD and 117 AD. And somewhere around the year 110 or 112, Pliny, the younger, Junior, who was the governor of Bithynia in northern Asia Minor during this time, wrote a letter to the Emperor asking for his wisdom and guidance on dealing with the Christians. 
He didn't quite know how to handle them. But first of all, notice what this means. In the, if the year was 110, then it was only two or three years before that probably St. Ignatius of Antioch was murdered in the Colosseum in Rome. If you read his seven letters, then you know that St. Ignatius of Antioch was taken by under ten, he calls them leopards, Roman guards from Antioch, way in the east, all the way to Rome, to face trial. Now, think of that for just a moment. We know that it was in Antioch that Luke tells us the followers of the way were first called Christians. But Christianity had spread. So by the year 110, 70 years or so after the death and resurrection of Christ, 40 years after the death of Peter and Paul in Rome, 20 years after the death of the last apostle, Christianity has spread across the empire. We know that by the late 2nd century, Christianity was in the British Isles. And we know that it was in South India. That's a huge geographical expanse. And Pliny tells us in this letter that it wasn't just geography. He could count among those who called themselves Christians both male and female, so it wasn't just an exclusive club. And they were young and they were old, so it was multi-generational. And, as he says, from every rank of society, or as we put in modern language, every socioeconomic level of society was represented among Christians. You see what had happened? In those 70 years, Christianity had become so widespread and therefore become what? Become troubling. What are they going to do about these Christians? So Pliny writes the letter to the Emperor Trajan. And here's what he says. He says, is it right to put Christians on trial because they are Christians? Or shall we only punish them if they commit some identifiable crime, perhaps being associated with being a Christian, or not? He tells them that he had already executed some of them, simply because of their stubbornness, their pertinacia, or their inflexible obstinacy. And Pliny wants to find out, did I do the right thing? Should I continue this practice, or should I not? From this letter, we discover also that probably we had Christian betrayers. We had people that ratted on other Christians. Because he said he received an, an anonymous list of names of people who were Christians from former Christians. So you see, the troubles of the church started from the very beginning. Pliny outlines what he had done so far. He said he examined those who were accused of being Christians, and if they denied being a Christian, either in the past or having once professed it but abandoned it, he required them to sacrifice to the gods and to the emperor, thereby cursing Christ, he says. When they did this, when they showed their loyalty to the state, he let them go. The letter makes it clear, I think, that Pliny did not want to punish Christians per se. Like bureaucrats and administrators, he just wanted to keep the peace. He didn't want to adjudicate the question of truth of Christianity. And so what he did was, he wanted to stop the spread of this thing he calls the contagion of this superstition. So Pliny writes the letter, and he outlines and asks for advice. And Trajan answers. And he says, Christians, don't seek them out. Do not persecute them. Don't target them. But, if you find that they are Christians, then, first of all, to be just, you must not base this on some anonymous accusation. They followed the rule that everyone accused had the right to face their accusers. But he says, if you learn of them, then question them, examine them, and give them the opportunity to repent and to show their loyalty by sacrificing, he says, nostri dei, to our gods. What do we conclude from this, about this socio-political uh, context? Persecution of Christians in the second century was not constant. 
It was sporadic. And most historians agree with that. Persecution of Christians in the second century was not targeting them for extinction. There was great religious diversity in the Roman Empire. We think we have diversity today. You should study ranged Roman history and see what they had. Believe me, it was there. They had Manichaeans. They had Zoroastrians. They had Jews. They had Christians. They had all kinds of different people in the Roman Empire. But the problem with Christians is that they were nonconformist. You see, they wouldn't put the government first because they worshipped a God who was above all. And so this superstition, as Pliny calls it, was really something that kept them from being conformist to the place and the times in which they lived. Now, if I was bold tonight, I might ask you to show, give me a show of hands about how many of you feel like you are conformist, or how many of you feel you are nonconformist. It's bred into my blood that I am a contrarian. <laughs> so, so I always find a way to argue with something. But God's grace does a lot of work in a man's soul. And yet, when you think about the world in which we live, I think it's hard for a Christian to look out into the world in we live in, the country we live in right now, and really feel at home, really feel comfortable. Because the world has changed. This country has changed quite dramatically, I think, in the last 50 years or so. I mean, it was never thoroughly Christian because there was no such thing as a thoroughly Christian culture. But it has really gone in very interesting ways, shall we say. When we look out at Christianity in America today, and maybe the Western world, it isn't that people are persecuting Christianity. But what they want is political conformity. And as long as you conform, and you just pray in a little church then everything will be okay. I'll come back to this theme just a little bit later. But here's my point to understand. That this same problem Christians were facing in the second century. Different world, different context, but the same problem. That's something of the socio-political context. What about the intellectual context? And in taking this step, to understand the world of the mind that St. Justin lived in, you will understand better, I think, what was driving him to what he said and what he believed. But now I need to point you to the very first page of the outline that I've given you. I believe on your outline it says, the philosophy of St. Justin Martyr, or does it say the philosophia of St. Justin Martyr? The original announcement was the philosophy of St. Justin Martyr. But I decided to use the Greek word philosophia for a very good reason. Because you see, when you use the word philosophy today, it doesn't have the same meaning that it philosophia had in the ancient world. And in order to understand Justin, you have to understand philosophia as he understood it. When people think of philosophy today, modern philosophy, they think of probably two, one of two things. They think of professional philosophy, the philosophy professors in universities. Often this philosophy is highly technical and arcane. And if you doubt me, just go look at a philosophical journal and see if you can understand it. <clears throat> the average person cannot understand it because usually it's written in a very arcane language. Or people use the word philosophy very loosely to mean kind of popular philosophy. Or they'll speak about philosophy of a business plan or something of that nature. Neither of these is what St. Justin understood by philosophy. So what was ancient philosophia? It was, as the word suggests, a search for wisdom. Philosophia etymologically means the love of wisdom. And that combined two things together. One was theoria, and the other was praxis. The theory and the praxis. But the word theory in English today does not have the meaning that theoria had in the ancient world. Theoria in Greek 
comes from the lat the uh, the verb theoreo, which means to gaze upon, to have a vision of something. Theory, in its best sense, is to have an understanding which gives you a proper vision of something. And so, when a when a engineer sits down to his computer to design something, he has a concept in his mind of what it should look like. And then he adds in all of the details. That's theoria. It's a vision of what is needed. Now, in America, if you look at our country historically, it's probably true that Americans have been very, very practical and not very theoretical. And I do think if I could redesign America, according to my wishes, that I would introduce more theoria or vision of thinking about what our society should be like. Why? Because many of the debates that take place within the Beltway, do you use that term here? Yes. Yeah. That take place within the Beltway are very practically concerned. Right? In other words, they're worried about taxes or they're worried about immigration or so forth and so on. But what no one ever gets to is the level of theoria. What's the philosophy that is to guide these decisions? They make the decisions, but they're not based upon a coherent philosophy or philosophy. That's why we need theory or theoria to know what a good society is, not just this or that particular decision. And it's that theoria that guides us when we don't know what to do. For example, what should we do in our society today about transgenderism? Right? Well, young people today largely are assuming that this is just, you know, this is the way things are, it's good, and so forth. What theoria should guide us? What vision of the human person should guide us in understanding whether that's legitimate or not? I won't give you an answer. You probably can guess it, but I won't give you an answer. But the point is, people don't know what a human person is. How can they decide what way to live when they don't know what a person is? You see? That's the root problem. But St. Justin wasn't just interested in theoria. He was interested in praxis, in action, in work. So that because he believed, as did almost all ancient philosophers, that true philosophy would lead to better living. Well, this is, explains why St. Justin embraced Platonism. Because Platonism gave the greatest vision of all the ancient philosophies, it gave the greatest vision of what it would be to understand and to live according to good principles. But there was another one, and this is mentioned, I mentioned the young English theologian Catherine Pickstock in her book After Writing on the Liturgical Consummation of Philosophy. She points out that in the dialogues of Plato, particularly one dialogue, the Phaedrus, that Socrates, Plato's great hero, wanted to talk about what the end or the purpose of our philosophy was. And the answer that's given is the end of philosophy. The purpose of it all is to praise the divine. Now, Plato did not have a concept of a personal God, but he at least understood that the purpose of human life is to elevate oneself or to be elevated, to, to have union with the divine. This is the why the great church fathers, from St. Gregory of Nyssa to Maximus the Confessor to St. Augustine and the rest, why they embraced Platonism, at least in a limited form, because it seemed to coalesce with Christian ideals. And then there were the Hellenistic philosophers, like the Stoics and the Epicureans. And the great historian, I mentioned his name there, Pierre Adel, the French historian of philosophy, who did more than any, any scholar in the 20th century to explicate the nature of ancient philosophy, he says in his book, The Philosophy as a Way of Life, that philosophia was not thought of as an academic discipline where you went to school and took a class. No, philosophia was a total engagement of the whole person in the precepts 
of philosophia. And this is why the Greek church fathers used the word philosophia about Christianity. Christianity is a philosophia. It's a way of living. It's a way of having vision and a way of living in praxis. Pierre Ardell points out then that more than being an academic discipline, philosophy as the love of wisdom in the ancient world was a pursuit of the good life and the search for a life lived with virtue and goodness. And that, I would suggest, is extremely relevant to our world. So relevant, in fact, that it wasn't too many years ago that the actor Kevin Kline produced and acted in the movie called The Emperor's Club. How many of you have seen The Emperor's Club? One person. You need to see that movie. I won't tell you the details other than it really raises the question of virtue and character in a very big way. It's well worth reading. By the way, Kevin Klein was educated at the Priory School outside of St. Louis, and he modeled his movie on that school in, in the movie. So, philosophia. As understood by St. Justin Martyr, what was it? It was a way of living. It was a vision of reality and of conforming one's life to that reality as so as to live in truth, in goodness, and in beauty. And that is why I do quotes a statement which he attributes to Epicurus, vain is that word of the philosopher who does not heal any human suffering. Philosophy is no good if it doesn't teach us how to live. And that's why much of what goes on under the title philosophy in modern universities really isn't philosophy. It's just technical analysis of conundrums. So this now brings us to the third part, or its fourth point um, on your your outline, faith and reason. St. Justin Martyr believed in the compatibility of faith and reason because he had faith in reason. That's so important that I want to repeat it again. St. Justin Martyr believed in faith and reason because he had faith in reason. Now the quotations that I've given you from the Apologies kind of get a little, just little snippets to lead you into reading more about it. But in the first apology, chapter 5, he says not only among the Greeks were these things revealed by reason, that is by logos, but also among the barbarians, which is the term the Greeks used to mean non-Greeks. So it doesn't mean in a bad term. We have a bad connotation or taste today, but you could just translate it non-Greeks. But he says, even among the non-Greeks, the Logos revealed these truths to people. So the people that had no connection with Christianity could see the truth before them. And if you look, for example, at some of the ancient philosophy of China and Confucianism and so forth, you'll see some great insights there. In Buddhism, there's great insights as well into the human person because they think and they reflect. It's this use of reason. But Justin is asking the question, what's the ultimate source of that reason? And then in the um, first apology, chapter 46, he says, we, are, we have been taught that Christ is the firstborn of God and that we've suggested above that he is the Logos. I've capitalized him. He is the Logos of whom every race and men and women partake. So that by using one's reason, one is actually partaking of a greater reason that is in the eternal Son of God. And they who lived with the Logos, to the extent that they understood it, are Christians, even if they were called atheists. You see, he even goes to the point of saying that Socrates was a kind of Christian because he lived with this Logos. He lived in conformity with it. Among the Greeks, there were Socrates and Heraclitus and others like them. 
And among the non-Greeks, the barbarians, there was Abraham and Elias and, and so on and so forth. And then thirdly, the quotation from the second apology, chapter 10. Our teachings, he means the Christian teachings, appear to be greater than every human teaching by the entire rational principle having become Jesus Christ. Now here he uses a different phrase, not logos, but he uses ton logikon. It's a, a substantive use of, a part, of an adjective. But he's done that, so they translated here the, the rational principle. The thing that makes sense of the universe. What is that? He says, we Christians believe that this rational principle became the Son of God, or he was the Son of God, but he became a man on earth. And he goes on to say, this Jesus Christ appeared for our salvation in body, reason, or logos, and soul. Whatever things were spoken well by the philosophers and the legislators, they did so by participating in the logos, either by discovery or by theory. But since they did not know the logos completely, who was Christ, they often said contradictory things. He's affirming three things here. First, he's affirming that all reason has its foundation in the logos. Now, if you study science and evolution and all of that, you eventually, and you're a seeker for truth, you come up against the question, how did human rationality develop? And you know how far we are in answering that question? Zero. We don't have a clue as to how human rationality, we don't even know how human language developed. But that question is a legitimate question. He says, whatever the details, all reason has its foundation in the Logos. Secondly, why were these pagans, these non-Christians, these people that didn't profess God, why were they able to discover truth? That's because all truths ultimately are God's truth. They come from God, and they're supposed to go back to God. The third point, there is no incompatibility between God's revealed truth in the Bible and in the church and other fields of knowledge. If you just think for a moment about modern atheism, people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and the late Christopher Hitchens, this is one of their fundamental beliefs. That belief in God is in battle with human reason, particularly science, because they see that as being the paragon of all human reason. The Christian tradition has been, and from this time forward, but especially developed by St. Augustine, that there's no incompatibility between the particular truths of the world and God. And that was tested. It was tested in the case of Galileo, because I, I wrote a book about it. I'll share that with you if you want to a little bit later. But in numerous places in the history of science, this affirmation of the compatibility of faith and reason was affirmed over and over and over again in the history of the Catholic Church. Well, I've shared enough with you already, and you've been very attentive. Let's take a short break and come back, shall we? Please welcome back Dr. Howe. Thank you. Well, because of time and without further ado, let me just pick up where I left off and summarize it this way. Justin believed in the intrinsic rationality of the universe and of human beings. Now, that may not sound like a problematic statement, but if you think about deeply about it, you might ask the question, if our universe evolved from out of chance, out of a chaotic state, why in the world would human beings be able to understand the universe? Why is the universe describable in human language and mathematics? And I will show you from a famous article written in the 60s by a physicist that he was puzzled by this very question, is why the universe is intrinsically rational. Well, 
St. Justin Martyr believed he had found the answer to that. It was because the logos, the reason, the rationality um, that's in the universe came from the great logos, which is the eternal Son of God. And so he gave an answer to something that people had been searching for for a long time. I'll give you an example. He lived in the second century AD. But let's go back two previous centuries to the first century BC. To the greatest of the Roman orators, statesmen and philosophers, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Cicero wrote De Natura Deorum, on the nature of the gods, in which he rehearsed all the different philosophical positions that he was aware of, and he did a very good job of covering all the different ideas about the gods among the philosophers. He himself was inclined to Stoicism, but he criticizes and interacts with particularly the Epicureans and the academics. The Epicureans were physicalists or materialists. They didn't believe there was anything beyond the material world. The academics were the skeptics. They didn't think you could have much knowledge of anything, kind of like the Peronic skeptics were. So as Cicero is reviewing these different philosophical positions, he raises a question, especially for the Epicureans. He says, what about the order, the beauty, and the structure of the cosmos? Can we imagine any greater beauty that is there in the world that we see around us? Uh, Cicero also wrote in his retirement, he wrote this thing, De Senectute, which I should read very soon. Senectute means on old age. Right? And, and he talks about the, the beauties of retirement. And he says one of the beauties of retirement is gardening, getting back close to the earth. As Cicero looks out into the world, he asks the question, you Epicureans, where did this order, this beauty, this structure come from? Mustn't there be a superior intelligence that would bring this about? Isn't that more rational to believe than that it just emerged out of nothing? A question still relevant today. St. Justin believed that he had found that answer. Because it, the world is beautiful. It is orderly. It is structured. Down to the points of the parameters of the universe, being if the gravitational constant, for example, were just a few decimal points off, the world wouldn't exist. It's very finely tuned universe that we live in. And so, St. Justin says, well, this can only be because there is an ultimate logos. And he says, that logos is Jesus Christ. Well, that reminds me of the words of that other great writer who spoke about the Logos. That is, St. John, the evangelist, when he said in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. But then later on, back down in verse 9, he says, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. That's the phrase that not only Justin, but other church fathers, especially the Greek church fathers, pick up on and say that that light that is shining down into the minds and the hearts of men is the Logos himself. That's the one who became a baby in Bethlehem. I'll come back to this in my concluding moments when I talk about modern applications. Now, I want to ask a slightly different question this evening. Because in this treatise on apologetics, we have three chapters. This is the first apology. We have three chapters that describe for us the liturgy of the church and the church's belief about the Eucharist. And then in the dialogue with Trypho the Jew, he has several different chapters in which he's arguing with Trypho about who has the real sacrifice that's acceptable to God. This is an odd point. Why would he tell a pagan emperor, or pagans in general, about the Eucharist, or about the liturgy? And I racked my brain for this. And then I realized 
that this man was wiser than I. Because what he realized was that if you're going to introduce people to the question of God, to the question of the Logos, don't introduce it to them piecemeal. Tell them the whole story. You see, can you really understand what Christianity is about if you don't understand the liturgy of the church? Can you understand Christianity if you don't understand the Eucharist? That's the very heart of our faith, that Jesus Christ is present, body, blood, soul, divinity, in the liturgy of the church and in the sacred elements. And that reality is what fuels our faith so that we too can be like St. Justin Martyr, defending and proclaiming the faith. And you see, if we don't explain that to people, then they're going to evaluate Christianity on their own terms. Have you ever noticed like, oh, should I mention the Washington Post? (laughs) The New York Times? the The Los Angeles Times? How whenever they ask a question about Catholicism, they're always filtered through their own grid. And they ask the questions that they think are relevant, not the questions that we think are relevant. Now, once in a while, you get an honest journalist come along and, you know, yes, they do examine it and they ask the right questions and all of that. But usually those media outlets, they are obsessed with political matters. So they want to ask what the Pope thinks about this, that, and the other. Rather than what the rationale is for the doctrine that the Pope can't change. You see? So it's important for us to tell the whole story. And at the root, St. Justin wants people to know Christianity is a supernatural religion. It doesn't, it's not only, reason is good and important and valuable, but it goes so far beyond that. If you look at the four passages that I've isolated there, the first one is in Apology, First Apology, chapter 65. Here he gives us an account of the baptismal liturgy, or at least what happens right after it. After the person is baptized, they're brought into the Eucharist or to the, to the synaxis of the church. And as they are, then allowed to participate. And he speaks in general about the elements of worship, which are in every form of liturgy within the church. There's the general intercessions. There's the greeting or the kiss of peace. There's the offertory of bread and wine. There's the Eucharistic prayers. There's the great amen. And then, of course, there is communion. Justin wanted people to understand what the meaning of this liturgical rite was. Because something I didn't mention to you earlier was that in Neoplatonism, for example, the famous philosophers Plotinus, Iamblichus, and Porphyry, by that time, this is like five centuries after Plato, they revived his teaching And they did more than just teach it in a verbal sense. They actually began to do rituals that were like what was called theurgy. It was an introduction into the mysteries. So you see how Christianity spoke to the world in which they lived. Because they had this idea in mind about entering into the divine. And the proclamation of the church was, we have the way to do that. You have to understand our liturgy to do it. Justin wanted them to understand. And so much so that when he's explaining the liturgy and he comes to the point of the great amen that we have at the end when the priest raises the sacred host and the sacred cup and says, through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. And we say, Amen. That's the great amen. And so he says, Amen, in the Hebrew language means, let it be. You see, he wanted them to understand that that Amen is an affirmation of the proclamation of Christ as the Redeemer. So, in this section of the Apology, he begins to explain what that liturgy is and what it means. But then, in the next chapter, chapter 66, he does more of a doctrinal explanation. And you'll notice, well, it's not on your sheet, but he begins that chapter with these words. This nourishment is called among us 
the Eucharist. Now notice that Eucharist, Greek word Eucharistia, means thanksgiving. In modern Greek, when you say thank you, you say karisto. And it's just, it's the word Eucharist. Well, this word, Eucharist, in the New Testament means thanksgiving. And it's almost certainly the case that never in the New Testament does the word Eucharistia refer to the sacrament. But already by the time of St. Ignatius of Antioch, and certainly Justin Martyr, now the word is being used in a technical sense. Because it refers to the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. In this particular chapter, he speaks about that nourishment of our flesh through the Eucharist. Here explaining the content of the church's doctrine, we see him saying, first of all, the requirements for receiving the Eucharist. First of all, baptism. No one can receive the Eucharist unless they are baptized. Why? Because baptism unites us to Christ and begins the journey of faith. Baptism is like the birth into the new life. But then the Eucharist is like the food for the infant as he or she progresses through life. Secondly, he says that the church's faith must be believed. He says no one is allowed to partake of it, that is the Eucharist, other than those who believe the things taught by us to be true. And then those whose sins are washed away, that's baptism, and who receive the washing leading to the new birth. And then he says in this way, it is for the one who lives as Christ handed down to us. So the third requirement is living in accord with Christ's teachings. And so no one should presume to be a part of the community or receive the Eucharist who is living in obvious and scandalous sin. Because they should seek, at least be seeking, to live in accord with Christ's teachings. And you can see how relevant that is to our political situation today by those in the political realm who profess to be Catholics. Justin, there's three things I want to note about this particular chapter. This is chapter 66. First, he clearly believes that the Eucharist is the same flesh as was born of the Virgin Mary. The real presence will in time become the heart and the soul of all Eucharistic doctrine and devotion, both West and East. But what is that that's in the Eucharist? Well, as many great Eucharistic poets have said, it is ineffable. And yet it is, in its substance, the same flesh that was born of the Virgin Mary. And how could it be otherwise? Because that could not feed our souls, nor lead us to heaven, or forgive our sins, all of which the church teaches, unless it were more than bread. Unless it were, in fact, the humanity of Jesus Christ. The second thing he teaches is that this Eucharist involves some kind of transformation. Let me read this this one sentence. He said, this food nourishes our blood and flesh by way of transformation. The Greek word is kata metabolain. It's a phrase. According to change. The word metabolain is the word from which we get the modern word metabolism. In other words, a transformation that takes place in some way or another. Now, it's not clear from this text whether he's talking about a transformation of the elements of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, or whether he's talking about a transformation that takes place in the person who receives the elements. And that shouldn't trouble us that he doesn't, isn't very explicit about it, because he's writing in the second century. It would take several centuries for the church to begin to sort this out. There's always a development of doctrine that goes on with regard to every doctrine that we hold. But let me take it in the second sense and explain it this way. When he says that this nourishes us by way of transformation or kata metabolane, he means, so it seems, that 
the Eucharist transforms the person who receives it into something different. In the seventh, yes, it's the seventh book of the Confessions of St. Augustine, chapter 10. God is speaking, as it were, to Augustine, as Augustine relates, and he says, come, and he says, receive me, receive the Eucharist, he means, and then stand up and grow, because I will not be changed into you as normal food is. But you will be changed into me. The Eucharist transforms us from ordinary people into saints. In fact, that's the only way you can be a saint. You can't do it on your own. It's only God's living His life within you that you can become a saint. And that, of course, is what he, why He came to earth and why He extends His his humanity in the Eucharist to us. So do you see? Why does St. Justin include this stuff about the Eucharist in this treatise of apologetics to pagans? Because he wants them to know and to understand this is the heart of what it means to be a Christian, to be changed from the inside, to become a new person in Christ. Then the last thing. The last point of the chapter, you will notice, he quotes from Jesus' words, this is my body, this is my blood. In other words, he wants to reinforce the fact that the Eucharist is not a human invention. It's not something we dreamed up one day and thought it might be a nice religious practice. It comes with divine authority. And to not practice it is to go against divine authority. I was sharing with Eric today that when I was teaching in a Presbyterian seminary. And I began to teach this class in the Eucharist that I mentioned earlier. And as I was reading the Church Fathers, Ignatius and Justin and all the others about the Eucharist, I began to realize that the best evidence that we have suggests that from the very beginning, the Church weekly celebrated the Holy Eucharist. In other words, it wasn't a later invention by somebody. Now, you have to understand something about the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Their claim, the debate between the Protestants and the Catholics was, who were the true Catholics? That is, who was like that ancient church? The claim of Calvin, who was the the forefather of my faith, or Luther, was that the, the Roman Catholics had distorted the faith. They had introduced all these pagan rituals into the liturgy, and into the devotion of the church. And of course they had some understanding, I mean, people were superstitious and so forth, but that wasn't the official teaching of the church. And then I began to realize, wait a minute, these ancient church fathers, they all, that that talk about the Eucharist, talk about it in terms of a weekly celebration that the church did, and we have indications of that in the book of Acts. Now, In my Presbyterian heritage, we believed that the Lord's Supper, as we called it, was a sacrament. It was a means of grace. But you didn't have to celebrate it every week. One day I remember asking the question, where did we get the right to throw out the Eucharist? On what authority did we do that? If, as Justin says, it was an essential part of the liturgy of the church. Do you see? He goes on then in the next chapter, in chapter 67, he recounts the Sunday liturgy for the emperor and for those he's writing to, the pagans. Why? Because no doubt they had thought that these Christians were up to no good in all that secretive meetings that they had. Right? And by the way, there's a lot of people who think that about the Catholic Church too, even today. But nevertheless, but they don't think the time to come in and find out, which would have been a lot easier, is a lot easier today than it would have been then. But the point that I want you to understand at this point is this, that St. Justin is trying to help the people who know nothing of Christianity to understand it. And in doing so, he goes to the very heart of what it's about. Perhaps you had the experience that my children had. I'll tell you the story from my son's 
point of view. I won't go into all of the background, but in about 2008, my son had been living away from home. He, had, he was an adult. He was in the service. Then he went to college and so forth. And my son was going through a very difficult time of his life at that moment. And so he was living about three hours away from us. So I decided that every weekend that I could, I would go over and be with him. And he bought this old house. He was refurbishing it. And so I would you know, paint the walls and we would talk and so forth. And we would begin to talk about deep spiritual things during this process. And we talked about marriage. And he then, now he's about, how old was he then? I don't know, about, I think about 32 at the time. And he says one time to me, Dad, when I was a boy and a teenager, I never realized how much you and Mom love one another. See, people can see things, people can be in the situation, but not understand what's going on. And I can witness very clearly, that's what happened to me. The first time in the I walked into a Catholic Mass, I was like, whoa, where is this all coming from? This was, I just didn't, couldn't make any sense of it. But as I went, oh, back and back every day, by the way, every day while I was still a Presbyterian minister, going to Mass, except on Sunday when I had to preach, of course. <laughs> but then I began to sort it out. And I began to find out what this really meant. And then I remember being blown away by the thought, you mean this is not just a symbol of Christ's body and blood? You mean you really believe he's there? In there? And I thought, whoa. This is a lot deeper than I thought it was. And it is. In fact, 20 years of being a Catholic now, I still have only scratched the surface. So what is he telling us then? He's telling us that if you want to explain Christianity to others, if you want to understand it for yourself, you're going to have to take your time, explain it well, answer questions. So to conclude this portion, the Eucharist and the worship of the church is the fulfillment and the highest expression of all human longing for transcendence, to go beyond this world. It is the fulfillment of all our genuine philosophical aspirations. And that's why some of the most the wisest people in the world have been the Christian mystics, because they've had that enlightenment given to them as a gift. They didn't study. They just received it. And so they could see it through that experience. And then finally, that the source and the summit of the Christian's life, we say that again, the source and the summit of the Christian's life is indeed the very life that sustains him or her in the Eucharist. Without this, there is no church. There is no Christianity. It's interesting today being over at Holy Transfiguration Church. I went into the bookstore and I bought a book by John Zizoulas, who is a Orthodox Greek Orthodox bishop. And this afternoon, as I was thinking and praying, I just opened the book and read it. Do you know what he says in the book? He says the church is primarily and lastly Eucharistic. What he means is. Without the Eucharist, there is no church. There is no Christianity. So we must, you see, explain this to people. Well, then finally, because of time, let me go to the last section, and that is modern applications. How does all of this history and this theology and philosophy relate to where we live today? First, to understand something about the subtlety of persecution. Now, it just so happens that in certain places like the Middle East, Christians are being targeted because of their faith. And perhaps that's true in the United States, but we don't see it on the surface. Those people in Oregon, the florist in Washington, were they targeted? Perhaps they were. But you never know it because... The language that's used is different. But here's the point. 
that even in under Roman persecution, from the time of Jesus to the time of Constantine in 313, even then, very rarely did they persecute Christians for being Christians. But what they wanted was conformity to their way of thinking and their way of life. And as long as you conformed, then everything was fine. And one of the saddest commentaries on modern Christianity is that there are churches that have compromised, badly compromised the faith. Thank God we pray and hope and believe that the church that is called Catholic will remain true and faithful to Christ and his teaching. But the reality of it is that whatever political leaders want, above all, they want conformity to their ideals and their laws. And we are willing to give it, and should be willing to give it, as long as it doesn't involve a betrayal of our faith. But if you read, for example, the martyrdom of Polycarp, which is the earliest martyrdom that we have, written, well, it the accounts about the second, mid-second century, around the same time. In that account, you see very clearly that the Roman governor is pleading with Polycarp, have mercy on your old age, Polycarp. Just sacrifice to the gods. But the thing that was viewed as political conformity on the part of the governor was in fact betrayal of Christ from Polycarp's point of view. Do you see? And that's where they don't understand one another. And that's why don't be expect to be understood for your faith when you have to demur in your commitment to the state. The second thing, that we Christians must continue to invoke support and champion reason because Christ is the Logos. He is the very font of all reason and rationality. This means a proper understanding of the powers and the limitations of human reason and the necessity of divine revelation. For example, How would we ever figure out, given our own human intellects, that God could become a man? It is absolutely beyond our comprehension. Isn't God God and man man? Or maybe you could have it like the Greeks. You know, the men who wanted to be gods, they'd become more godlike and less manlike. Or the gods would come down, they'd become more manlike and less godlike. How do you get a man who's fully God and fully man? We never would be able to figure that one out. There are limitations to our human reason. And my mathematician friends tell me there's limitations in calculating mathematics too. But here's what we can say. That question that I raised earlier about the intrinsic rationality of the universe comes back into play. Eugene Wigner was a physicist. In the 1960s, he wrote a famous article read by all physicists and mathematicians, get this title, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. The Unreasonable Effectiveness. Now, high schoolers, you know, when they study math and they study science and they learn how to apply mathematics to physical situations like force equals mass times acceleration or the uh, pressure and the volume of a gas are inversely proportional, all these things... They think, oh, they think nothing of it. Well, of course mathematics applies. You see, they're not asking the deepest question. That's the question Wigner was asking. Why in the universe we live in would mathematics even apply to the universe? There's no explanation for it. And here's what he says at the end of the article. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in the future and that it will extend, for better or for worse, to our pleasure, even though perhaps to our bafflement, to wide branches of learning. Why does it work? Well, that's the question philosophy asks. Why? Do we have human rationality? Why are we not just advanced apes, as many modern people believe, Why are we qualitatively different than any other species on the face of the earth? And if you're not convinced of that, 
I'll be glad to convince you. But this emphasis upon reason is a deep current in Christianity, and the denial of reason is actually a deep current in the modern world. Now, that may sound strange to you, but that's why Pope Benedict gave the lecture at Regensburg University in 2006, where he says that what's happened in the modern world is that people have truncated reason. They think reason is only true about science, but they don't use reason about higher things than science. And my experience reading philosophy for 40 years confirms exactly what he's talking about. But I'll illustrate it with a down-home story. I had a student, friend, actually did take one class from me, but he was a PhD student in biology. But he was studying theology because he just wanted to learn, and he was a very bright student. We had a wonderful relationship. And one day he told me a story about one of his biology professors. So he was doing research in his lab on plant biology, and the professor made some kind of a statement like, well, Science, that's the only thing that's sure. Everything else is opinion. So morality, politics, everything, it's all opinion. Just science is the only thing we really know, for sure. You see, that man had truncated reason. He didn't even try to reason about moral issues. He just thought it was opinion. Now, if you, don't think, if you think it's opinion, why should you even try to reason it out? But having done that for many years... I and many others know, yes, you can reason. You can use reason about moral issues. It's tough. It's difficult. It's complicated. But it can be done if you're willing to put in the effort. Our modern world does not champion reason like you think it does. In fact, it's we Christians who need to champion reason. The third point. That means, therefore, that we need to call our society back to morality as practice and as theory, as practice. We must strive to live in accord with the highest morals that Christ has revealed as he revealed those norms to us in Scripture and in the church. And we must not be afraid to articulate those moral norms that are in the natural order of things and in the revealed Word of God in Scripture. When I've taught the subject of morality to my students in the past, they clearly believe, or at least they think others believe, and I think you'll agree, that most people in America believe that, well, if you have a moral belief like abortion is wrong or something, well, that's your opinion, right? There's no way to argue that that really is wrong. But just to give you an example of how confused people can be, when I was a graduate student, We were standing around the table one day, the graduate students, we were getting our lessons ready for the teaching of the undergrads. And I got into a, fell into a conversation with a young woman about my age. And of course, this was in the early 1980s. So this was only 10 years or so after the Roe v. Wade decision. And she said, well, you think abortion is wrong? And I said, absolutely. It's, It's a murder of a human being. And she said, well, it's not your decision. And I said, well, you're right about that. It's not. She said, it's the woman's choice. It's her decision. And I said, oh, yes, you're right. It is her choice. You know? And I said, but you know, what about this and what about that and so forth? And she said, but it's her choice. And I said, well, what about this? What about that? Well, but it's her choice. And I said, yes, I understand. It is her choice. No one can make that decision for her. But the question is, then will she make the right choice? You see what she had done? She would conflated the agent of the decision-making with the criterion as to which how you decide whether something is right or wrong. She would obliterated the question simply by saying it's the woman's choice. Now, that's wrong on a number of accounts. But certainly it's wrong on the account of she simply wasn't using a reason to think through the question. Do you see? And I wasn't even insisting that she agree with me. I was just trying to get her to think about it and to use a reason to arrive at a good conclusion. We must, if we're going to be any agents of redemption in our culture, 
We must not be afraid first to live our moral faith. And we know we all do that imperfectly, but nevertheless God calls us through constant confession, repentance, and seeking holiness to live that faith. Secondly, though, we must not be afraid to articulate that faith where it's appropriate and whatever context that may be. Sometime, sometimes it may seem that we are speaking to a brick wall or maybe that nobody's listening to us, like the March for Life that's going to be next week here in Washington, D.C. I doubt very seriously it'll get a lot of coverage from the mainstream media. But nevertheless, those young people are there and they are the hope of our future, of our world, of our society, of our nation. Fourthly then, Christ is the culmination and the consummation of all truth, of every form of knowledge, of all that is true, good, and beautiful. Let me quote to you from a very famous patristic scholar at the Chicago, I mean at uh, Catholic University of America, at CUA, back in the 1940s and 50s, there was a man named Johannes Quaston, and he was a very famous scholar of the patristic period. He wrote a book, uh, many books, but in one of them he says, in his books on patrology, it was by incorporating this idea of a spiritual sacrifice he's talking about, that Justin, by injecting this into Christian doctrine, he appropriated for Christianity the highest achievements of Greek philosophia, and at the same time, underscored the new and unique character of Christian worship. Now there is a pattern for all of us. We take what is good in society. We take what is true and beautiful in our world, be it from science to art to anything, and we don't reject it. We incorporate it into our understanding of the world. But then we go beyond that and we say, but those things, as true as they are, point to something higher. Christ is the culmination and the consummation of all truth. The church that Christ founded then is the place, this is the last point, that the church that Christ founded is the place where we find lasting truth, meaning, and happiness. The liturgy of the church is the expression of those heavenly truths that allow us to participate in the powers of heaven. The book of Revelation, in the very end of the scriptures, paints for us a cosmic battle. And you and I on earth are the soldiers in that cosmic battle. It's not a battle with weapons, physical weapons. It's not a material world battle, but it's a battle for the mind. It's a battle for the heart. And our weapons are truth and goodness and beauty. And that's what St. Justin reminds us of, that we too, as he did in the second century, can be saints. And we can be saints who make a difference, not just for our generation, but for generations to come. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Al. Thank you. What a wonderful and comprehensive articulation of both the nature and purpose of philosophy and that characteristic of, of our faith that is, it is universal, it is Catholic. You always love that t moment when a, a student, someone new, learns for the first time that Catholic means universal, right? And what that means to them, it's just marvelous. Thank you so much. I want to connect um, two talks. Yeah, thank you. Just want to bring your attention to two talks that we have in our library. First one uh, that continues this theme of what is the... Uh, true purpose of philosophy and how it's not supposed to be something that keeps us locked in a room and 
detached from the world, but is actually the, the most practical art, and at the same time the least practical, is the Senecan Seminar. We just had this last quarter. It's online. It's not in CD, but you can listen to the whole recording online. It's a two-part uh, seminar on uh, introduction into Roman philosophy. And then I also want to bring to your attention a talk that we had from Robert Riley. One of the best ways you can understand or appreciate something is to view the opposite of it. And so as we get a reminder tonight of that beautiful truth about our faith, that there is no contradiction between reason and faith. And there, there's no sort of conflict between these two things. And in fact, our very God is the source and origin of reason. To better appreciate that, I recommend to you the talk that we had, The Closing of the Muslim Mind. This was a two-part talk. This gives a crystal clear articulation of what religion is like once reason is believed to be in conflict with God rather than emanating from him. We'll come back for Q&A um, in just two minutes. Thanks. Okay, questions and answers. Who's first? Uh, you mentioned that you were still preaching as you were learning about the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. How did that affect your preaching, if at all? Did everybody hear the question? No. The question was um, that I mentioned that I was still preaching while I was investigating the Catholic faith. Well, at first it wasn't too bad because, you know, I was just kind of doing an intellectual exercise uh, looking for it, but as I became more and more convinced, one of the big moments was the realization that I had no authorization to celebrate the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. You know, and we didn't believe it's the Eucharist, but so I would celebrate the Lord's Supper. But who gave me the authority to do that? Well, it was a group of men that were in the Presbytery, and. Um, I realized that but when I became to believe in apostolic succession, then I realized I didn't have it. Not only did I not have it, the Presbyterians don't even believe in it. So I realized I can't go on. So I stopped preaching and so forth. And I mean, I, I was still ordained. I still had my, my credentials, but I stopped actively doing that. But I was teaching in the seminary, so it didn't matter as much. That was the big change is when I realized I had to leave the seminary because I could no longer teach the students what I was supposed to teach them. Dr. Howell, did um, St. Justin ever explain or profess to Pliny the Younger or to Trajan um, the hope, his hope, and their hope in the resurrection? Yes, he did, but not to them because he, they were dead by the time he came along. But uh, I was just using that as an illustration. They were at the beginning of the the second century, he was in the middle. Yes, but he definitely talks about the resurrection in both apologies, especially the first apology. Uh, and, he, and the way he puts it is, as you would put it to a person that doesn't believe, it's say, you know, as he said, we believe this is not ordinary bread and wine, but it's the body of Christ. So we believe that this Jesus who died rose again on the third day. And in fact, in chapter 67, if you look at that, he talks about, we call this Sunday, because this is the day in which the Lord rose from the dead. Yeah. So that proclamation, yeah, certainly is central. Um, yes, doctor. I'm not well versed in it, and you didn't use the term itself, but when we're talking faith and reason, can you make a recommendation on any contemporary works that speak to intelligent design and the, the use of that in an ap apologetics way when you, we are facing a, a culture that, one, has a loss of faith and a, a, a diminished reason, and we're still supposed to promote both of them. Well, that's right. There is a diminished reason, a diminished use of reason. They have the reason, but they don't use it. The one thing I think um, the Discovery Institute in um, Was Seattle, Washington, uh, and look at their website and the people associated with them, William Dembski, He's written a lot about this. Stephen, oh, his name escapes me at the moment. But these are all very uh, well-educated and intelligent men who have written about it. And they, they, some of them would be on their website. Now, 
you will find Christians, not necessarily Catholics, but well, some Catholics, who don't endorse the idea of intelligent design, but then you have to ask them, well, what is it that you don't endorse? Now, scientists work on a methodological assumption. It's called methodological naturalism. That means that they have to assume that the laws of nature are operating in the particular thing that they're studying and that there's no supernatural forces at work in that. To them, it seems, intelligent design seems to say that God is entering into and making things differently at certain points in time. Now, the extreme anti-intelligent designer, anti-ID people, will, will say, well, it's going to destroy science. But that isn't true. Because if you believe in intelligent design, it depends on what form you believe in. If you believe in it that God you know, intervenes to make new forms of life that are evolving, but they don't evolve according to Darwinian principles, that's one form of intelligent design. But the question of intelligence is, while not empirically decidable, is an intelligent question and must be asked. And if you don't ask the question, you are truncating your reason. You're denying your ability to make inferences about the world beyond. I hope I didn't answer that too obliquely. But do you understand what I mean by that? No, no, it's not an oblique question. It's just that intelligent design is not a scientific hypothesis, but it's a rational hypothesis and ought to be treated as such. And one of the real deficiencies of education is that kids can go through 12 years of high school, four years of college, and they never address the question. And that's what I'm speaking with the gentleman about this, about how education today is very, very deficient. Just wondering how Justin the Martyr died. How he died? Yeah. Yes, we have an account. He and seven, was it six or seven companions, they were, they were martyred in Rome. Around, we think, during the time of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius became the emperor in 162 A.D., and he wasn't in Rome very much. He was out on the you know, battlefields with his troops. And he's an interesting man because he's the only emperor that ever wrote a book of philosophy. It's called Meditations. And you can get it. It's been translated numerous times. But uh, it was during that time that J Justin was brought to, to trial and found guilty and so forth and so on. Now, I don't remember the details about what the accusations were and things like that. But it's not a very long document. You can find it. It's, it's probably, I think it's titled The Act, or Acta, The Acts of Justin Martyr and His Companions, something like that. We'll close with this question. Um, can you talk about the limitations of mathematics? Let me make this theological, too. Um, so, how many, how many fractions are there between zero and one? There's an infinite number, right? Okay. If you had an infinite amount of time, you could count them. All right? Now, how many real numbers are there between zero and one? No, real numbers. No, no, no. There's an infinite number of real numbers between zero and one. If you had an infinite amount of time, you still couldn't count them. There are numbers you can't count. It's been proven by the 19th century mathematician Georg Cantor proved that this was true. And I have a friend who showed me a different type of proof, but it's still a proof. Now here's what's interesting, theologically. Does God exist? How do you know that God exists? Okay, people get confused. You can know some, that something is true without knowing what it is. So I know because I've seen the proof that there's an infinite amount of real numbers between zero and one, but I'll never be able to, to touch them, to talk to, to see them. 
I know there must be a God. I don't just believe there's a God. I know there must be a God. Because if you don't, if you don't believe that there is a final cause to the universe, then you have no explanation for the universe. This, is, this was Aristotle's argument. And the older I get and the more I think about it, the more I realize he was true, he was right, and there's no answer to it. You see, science operates on the basis of asking the question of what caused this thing to happen, right? So you keep asking the question, what caused this, what caused that, what you go back, all right? But then you get to the beginning, whether in time or in the, the whole structure, and you say, what's the cause of it? So what Stephen Hawking said in his book, The Brief History of Time, is, I don't know. <laughs> well, what has he done? He's given up science at that point, at that moment. He's given up the scientific quest to ask what the cause is. And that's because physical scientists, physicists and chemists, and all that, they think in order to have an answer, you have to have something physical. But if you understand the mathematical point, is that I know, there's an, I know there's numbers in there and I can never see them. I know there must be a God even if I'll never see him. You see? So that's how mathematics helps us in understanding of God. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Al. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.